you have to come with a theory. You have to believe something as a founder, as an investor, but you've got to set up an experiment. You've got to find a way to validate that before you go put serious amounts of cash and years of your life in it. I'm uh, Sky Kurtz. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Peer Harvest Smart Farms. At uh, Peer Harvest, we design, we build, and we construct and then operate very high-tech hybrid growing systems that allow us to localize food production really anywhere, including here in one of the harshest environments in the world in the United Arab Emirates. And we actually built this company, uh, really started in the Middle East for, for several reasons. We saw the Middle East as a microcosm for a pretty a, a global challenge that's coming. People talk about the 70% more food needed by 2050 to feed nine and a half billion people, but they never double click on where. The problem is not equally distributed. Um, in markets like ours, where we're 80, 90% import dependent, that is where all of the problem is. Some of the greater economies in the world, like America, are net exporters of food. Brazil, net exporter. Um, Australia, China. But whereas in the Middle East and Indonesia, parts of Japan, parts of South America and all of Africa and the Middle East is, is in trouble, right? That is where 100% of that great challenge is. And we saw a big opportunity that if we could develop a solution for that, we could one, build a big and successful company, but also really, you know, put that dent in the universe, right? Do something good for a group of people that are going to face incredible challenges in the next 30 years. And so that was the bigger macro opportunity. But secondly, the Middle East is really a microcosm for this problem in that we have an extreme climate of heat and humidity, and we have a diverse uh, uh, socioeconomic demographic with a rising middle class, fast growing populations. And, and, and when you think about all those markets I talked about, a lot of them have similar dynamics to that versus more mature places with flat to declining populations, et cetera. So we saw it as a great proof point, but most importantly was for the tech. If we could develop a solution here that can control the extremes of heat when it hits 51 to 53 outside, or humidity, it gets, it gets to 100% humidity. If you can solve that, you can do it anywhere. You can dumb down your tech to markets like Saudi Arabia, Arizona, um, places like uh, Singapore. And so that's why we built this here. And so far it's been a, a great success. And we built a pilot facility uh, planted in August 9th of 2018. And we have had continuous production ever since. We are maintaining a perfect Mediterranean climate corridor in the greenhouse. And in that corridor, you can grow just about anything, tomatoes, capsicum, cucumber, strawberry, aubergine, lettuce, microgreens, herbs, in any variety, right? So what we've done is we've decoupled the relationship of food production with climate and with climate change. And instead, we've married the sun, right? We see ourselves as an energy company. We convert sun energy into calories as cheaply as possible. Everything we do as a business and our technology is an energy conversion mechanism. and so. By doing that, we've, we've again decoupled from climate and instead we've made it possible to grow in some of the harshest places in the world that are import dependent that are within kind of 3,000 miles of the equator. It's billions of people, huge uh, addressable market opportunity and one that really nobody else was focused on. So we're proud to kind of be pioneers in controlled environment ag in the Minasa region, but really have developed a solution that we think can you know, put our dent in the universe. So it sounds like this tech is going to have massive impact for, for millions around the world once it's, it's sort of proven uh, locally. And it makes absolute sense why you would start in the Middle East, as you say, with such a harsh climate. But when you were starting this, did you have people saying to you, look, why don't you just start it in Arizona, where it may be slightly easier to try prove it? Did you have people trying to talk you out of, uh, out of the strategy you're, you're playing out now? Absolutely. Um, investors, um, my wife's father, I mean, people thought I cracked, you know, they're like you had a successful career in Silicon Valley as a tech investor. And now you have you lost your marbles, you're, you're moving out to the deserts of the Middle East to, to build tomatoes in the desert. Um, and now it's a foregone conclusion that controlled environment ag is a great idea. And governments are supporting it. We've received tremendous support, including from the Abu Dhabi Investment Office, the Mohammed bin Rashid Innovation Fund, yada, yada, yada. But four years, five years ago, I mean, when we started talking about this in 2016 and launched the company in 2017, people thought I was crazy. You know, they, it's not going to work. Farming isn't economic in places like that. What about water? Um, but ironically, we, we provide a solution to a lot of those. It's food security, water conservation, economic diversification, and sustainability all with one hammer, right? A lot of nails we hit. And so 
I saw this as a great place to do that, knowing that eventually I could come to Arizona or Monterrey, Mexico, or New, New Mexico, Nevada. Uh, but really, again, if I proved it there, it would still be a major technical risk to move it here. I mean, something I have to underscore about the climate difference. I'm from Arizona originally, right? I grew up uh, in, in a small town in Northern Arizona. But Arizona for about two months of the year has monsoon storms. During those times, there's a bit of humidity. And during those times, the local and incumbent farms struggle like heck. The heat is actually can be overcome. It's the heat and the humidity that is absolutely killer for plants. And it's why if you look around the world in these import places, they either have extreme cold climates like Russia or Siberia, but more likely in the populous areas of around the equator, it's tropical climates, desert subtropical, or arid climates. And these ones are ones that kill the ability to produce food. All the things that we eat, like rainforests do just fine in tropical climates, right? Mm -hmm. But you can't really eat those trees. Mm -hmm. um, and so, whereas for things like a tomato or a shrub or a, a strawberry, right? These don't grow in those climates. They're in more moderate Mediterranean style climates in places like parts of South America and most of the Mediterranean, Europe and America. Mm. So you come up with this big idea. You have plenty of people by the sounds of it trying to talk you out of it or at least trying to get you to alter the strategy. What are the first steps that you put in place to, to really bring this to life and, and to really figure out if it works or not? Well, James, first I had to believe and want to eat my own cooking before I went and begged for people's money and convinced them. So I was, I was an immovable object by the time I went out for people's money because I had done extensive work on my own. With my co-founders, I personally had a list of need to believes. I had to prove to myself this, this, this. And I went and flew around the world. I went to Holland. I went to Australia. I went to Monterrey, Mexico. Went to Arizona, Tucson, meeting Cornell's Controlled Environment Ag Program, uh, University of Arizona's. So the reason I say that is I had done the work to have the conviction to first put my own money in and that we backed it ourselves early on and then go ask for other people's money. And I, I believe, James, that's important for entrepreneurs. When I angel invest, one of the first things I ask is like, what do you have at risk? If you want my money and it's such an investable idea, why aren't you investing? Even if they don't have a lot of wealth, they should put a dollar, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, I'm, that's one point. So by the time people are challenging it, I knew I was right um, and, and that this was a potential. But the second thing on how did we test it? We first found a, a, a partner, an Emirati partner, who's my co-founder, Mahmoud Adi. We secured a land site that was optimal, the right water, the right roads, and all the access and things we needed. And then we did the design and engineering and technical work to say, on this GPS coordinate, here's how we'll size the climate system, this power price, how much, and build the financial picture of what this thing would be. And then, of course, we had to go sell the dream, right? I had to go with a PowerPoint, a pile of dirt, and the promise of what we built. I had to go you know, talk to investors all over the globe. We ended up raising a $5.8 million seed round, in which at, in, at the time was the largest ever seed financing in the Middle East, North Africa. And very hard to do because our business is capital intensive, James. Mm -hmm. And that made it hard. MVP, this was the MVP, right? There was no ability to build something smaller. It was a commercial scale deployment to prove the first one. But that's what we set out to do. We said, hey, investors, let us build a commercial scale pilot, grow in it for a couple of years and learn from it. And we will fail small or win big, right? And lose $5 million. Or if this is right, there's massive potential. We'll raise gobs of capital and we'll build. And that's where we are today, right? We've closed $116 million. We have $100 million commitment for future expansion from our partner, Wafra in Kuwait. And now we're talking to global investment firms. There's a big opportunity over many years to deploy you know, hundreds of millions of capital to domesticate food production and in these countries that are importing it from elsewhere. And as I mentioned, it has added benefits of job creation, sustainability, and reducing their incumbent water consumption, et cetera. So mm -hmm. now, James, we're trying to innovate in our own system, but also we're trying to find ways to partner with incumbents, partner with power plants and use their assets, partner with uh, retailers and directly integrate and supply them, partner with CO2 suppliers. So people that have flue gases, we want to latch onto them, capture those flue gases and the waste heat and harvest those into our processes, right? It makes us more competitive, but also helps us to kind of blitz scale because we really want to tackle this problem and we think we can make a dent in the next three to five years. Mm. And, and when you're approaching the investors, then I love how you put it, that you had your, your need to believes list of your own that you felt that you had to prove. Give us an idea. What, what were some of the, the things on that list? 
Yeah, I mean, I can almost cite it verbatim from memory, but uh, but first of all, I needed to believe there was a large market, right? And I, I remind you, James, my background, I, I spent my career as a technology investor before I became an entrepreneur, right? I worked for a Silicon Valley technology investment firm and prior to that, a New York-based private equity firm. So I actually, as a founder, came with a different skill set and perspective. I said, look, I'm going to lay out an investment thesis and then I've got to prove or disprove the elements of these thesis, which is the proper way to invest in my view. So one of the theses is a big addressable market that people actually buy fresh produce in these regions and that, um, that I could access that market and have an economic opportunity. Second was based on our design and our work, would my manufactured cost of food be competitive against comparable quality imports? I needed to know that once I built it, I cannot have faith that consumers where this is new would pay a premium for local sustainable whatever I had to assume they don't care that I'm buying a tire, right? And it's lowest cost, but technically acceptable solution wins. So I actually played and designed our cost structure to be competitive, even if we were a total commodity. Obviously, that hasn't been the case. We've been embraced as higher value, it's better quality, it's tasty, et cetera. But for my own underwriting and before I took your money or others, I needed to believe I could be cost competitive. I needed to then believe that we could build it here. So understanding the permitting and regulatory environment that we didn't Kind of step on any uh, toes that would be we would raise the capital and be unable to actually construct and deliver the project and that was a tremendous amount of work to understand the building and construction dynamic etc i also needed to believe i could assemble a team so i went out and recruited growers or agronomists because convincing a dutch grower or american grower to leave their giant scale greenhouse in the heart of holland and move to the deserts of alain uh, not the easiest thing to do, right? So I needed to believe I could recruit a team that would commit their life to this like I did, right? We needed to secure a site. So I needed to believe that land could be uh, um, essentially appropriated by a foreign-owned company and operate. And I made, oh, and of course that the returns would work, right? I had to look at the financial returns of the, okay, if my box does what I believe it will do as a pilot and proves these marginal economics or unit economics, okay, when I extrapolate to lots of, of area, that will become a company that can absorb overheads and be very, very profitable. And I benchmarked against all the global players that are like, there's a public uh, controlled environment ag player in uh, Sydney, Australia called Costa. I was benchmarking against everything, right? So I think James, to, you can hear, I was extremely thorough and rigorous. I spent seven months studying the heck out of, will this work before I went out to get people's money and doing everything I could on my own money to tech, test the feasibility studying incumbent systems in the most comparable climates I could find in the world, yeah, yada, 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 right? Even by the way, uh, one last thing I'd say, James, is that before I went and hired an army of engineers to build the first one, a lot of people go, okay, I have an idea. I'm gonna go get a bunch of money, go hire an army of engineers and then find out if my idea works. I was like, well, I'd rather hire an army of engineers. I, I hired a design engineering firm to help me design my first prototype and then used the drawings and the designs and the ability to go raise the capital, right? So. I, I didn't, I was trying to be as capital efficient as possible in that early design to protect people's capital while there still was technology risk. And that was a key part of our early uh, uh, thesis. Mm, so it sounds like in the early days, you, you almost got the balance right while pulling in two directions. It sounds like you had this unwavering belief in, in the product and what it could do. But at the same time, you were very conservative in that you tested everything. You didn't assume customers would pay more than, than what they're currently paying and, and so on. With your time as, as an investor, do you find that people don't get this pull between the two right and they are just so focused on their, their belief and everyone's going to pay the maximum amount for it and, and so on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, interesting, James. I just had this conversation the other day. Um, I'm very close to Sharuk Investments, one of the investment firms that backed us, and they have a new group of associates. And I was kind of giving us a, a sermon on training them as the, from the perspective of the entrepreneur and the investor, right? And I just had this discussion where a long time ago, I found online, and it may still be available online, the CIA handbook or training book for how to, uh, um, how to analyze problems. And I thought it was, I'm a big nerd, and I wanted to learn how to think better. One of the things that they did that was really fascinating to me is they first took you through all these co uh, cognitive biases that people have. You've probably heard of many of them, like the fact that we have a, the fallacy of composition, tree, uh, assuming what's true for one thing is true for others. And Another one would be that we have, um, uh, uh, we have a confirmation bias. If we believe something to be true, we look for all information that, info that reasserts that view rather than even seeing information that refutes our current view. 
So there, there's many more, right? There's at least eight or nine cognitive biases. Now, one of the things that I would say is, and I, it's a big question that you just asked, which is people make some assumption about the world, whether they just believe it or whether they read some report or whether they saw some similar situation and think it applies here, but they don't do the work to say, do I now have a cognitive bias and I'm only looking at data that reaffirms that to be true or did I really test it, right? And, and, and for example, I'm gonna give a powerful example of where a graveyard of capital was lost back in the day in this, biometrics. When that came out in the 1980s, everyone was like, you know what? The ATM is dead, the four digit pen is over. Well, here we are, it's 2021, how many four digit pens do you use? And the interesting thing is everyone believed this technology is clearly better it's clearly, and everyone believed their own BS and invested tons of venture capital and all. Nobody ever identified why do people resist biometrics? And what it came down to is that people associated them with criminals, that the thumb is a criminal, and then they think the thing is dirty. The irony is they'll touch a door handle in a bathroom, but they won't touch that thing, right? But if you just asked, you would have been able to say, all right, I'm a smart investor who understands why this technology should be dominant. But there's something else, another factor that makes it impossible. And here it is, 40 years later, still impossible. And so I think that that's an important thing, what you just said, which is you have to come with a theory. You have to believe something as a founder, as an investor, but you've got to set up an experiment. You've got to find a way to validate that before you go put serious amounts of cash and years of your life in it, right? To the best you're able, right? There's limitations to what you can test sometimes, but you got to at least try. And I think that was a key element of how we viewed, you know, proving out this business before we took people's money. And this is something that will play out with every round and every time you, you scale the business up. So say the, the second round of funding, for instance, it may not be quite as obvious to people what those, as you put it, the, the need to believes are. So how, how did that evolve for you in terms of once you'd sort of gone past the first phase of it? So second phase, what were the things you then needed to prove to yourself, the business, the investors? Very good question. So you're right. At, at every phase of the business, you had a new set of questions that, you know, what got me here won't get me there, right? And for example, once we had proved the pilot in our first build and we had the operational data and metrics, first I studied the heck out of a, what does this box tell me? So I had to work to normalize the numbers. Like, well, that was an irregular event because of a pump going out. So strip that from my yield data trying to get to a true pro forma understanding of the unit economics and the potential. Then I said, well, what assumptions about how to deliver this business turned out to be wrong? So the people, the strategies, the execution, the cash needed to deliver the business. Turned out I was wrong on a lot of things. We needed more working capital. The yields were so much higher than we ever thought possible. I needed more people to harvest, right? So I had to actually change the operating model. And so challenge some assumptions and rebuild that. But then what was I kind of, what was the bets of the next phase? It was, for example, could we grow other crops? So I knew we could maintain a perfect climate, but I now needed to really understand the agronomical and kind of technical and biological requirements of these new crops and that our system would accommodate them too. That required a lot of research in them. We worked with agronomists and crop consultants and whatever. Another example is, is our market just like the other markets we want to enter? We want to go into Saudi Arabia, very different place than the UAE. Surprises a lot of people, but like there in, in Saudi Arabia, there's there's modern retail that is like Waitrose or Spinney's or anything like this, or um, uh, Safeway in America. But then there's also Bajalas. These are like informal trade, dude with a shirt off selling like fresh produce on the side of the street, right? You got to think about, is my, does my value proposition hunt there, right? And so we had to do a lot of that, of, of, of evaluate these hypotheses about the markets we were entering. Would our truths remain true, right? And then... Uh, build a narrative that we believed and that was investable. And, and that's an example of one. Uh, one other one I'd mentioned, by the way, is regulatory. Uh, the interesting thing about a market like the GCC or now we're looking in Southeast Asia, these are really different regulatory paradigms, right? And when you run a business that uses, you know, gases and electricity and, and it, we're a manufacturing operation, capital intensive, we break earth and permitting and it is complex, right? Something, James, I learned about our business that as we scaled up, that's I didn't know when I started and man, had I known I would have resourced differently is this. We're really five companies in one. We're a manufacturing company, a technology company, an agribusiness, a food farmer, right? A farmer, a CPG company. Uh, we, we sell consumer packaged goods in B2B to C and market and online and you name it. And last but not least, we're a real estate development company. We have to literally geotechnical surveys, water wells, construction, contracting, contractor management, insurance. It is a seriously complex business, right? 
So James, one of the things that all of my planning in the world couldn't have prepared me for the unknown unknowns, right? I could not have known those things until I lived it. But what you got to do is keep updating yourself, right? You asked earlier how, as a founder, how have you changed? I think I've constantly been humbled of, hey, I think I, I think I really got it now. I think I understand the full system. And then every year, some powerful insights that change how we think about leading the business. You know? But I think that capacity for change is what keeps you at, at the front of your game, right? Is that you're willing to be humbled and, and say, I was wrong about, about some assumptions about the world. Let me fix it. Or if I can't fix it, let me find someone who can and bring them into my team. Mm. What, what's interesting there is from, from an outsider's point of view, it's a very much a, a tech led business. You've then gone into it and it's quite clearly these sort of five main pillars within the business that make it tick. And then one other thing that you, you've mentioned a, a couple of times now in passing is actually the team behind it. So from all of those points of view, how, how do you view the business in terms of is it a people led organization? Is it very much a tech led organization? Or is it really, really even across the sort of five or six pillars that you've mentioned? Good question. I, we would articulate ourselves as a technology-enabled agribusiness, but fundamentally what that leaves out is I believe all businesses are people businesses, right? These assets sit quietly. In fact, it's actually really hard when you run a growing thing. It produces, there's no red button to say, oh, the line broke, let me fix it and let me stop. The crop keeps growing and if you let it grow out of balance, it takes everything with it, right? So it's actually, a this is a ruthless business because you got to constantly be focused on on your A-game, systems up and running perfection. I actually used to run a composite materials business. God, that was easier. Because you could say, hey, something's wrong with quality. Let me stop the line and figure it out, right? Not here. You know, it is coming. And so it is about people, their commitment, their focus, their willingness to make the sacrifices. But I, I believe that we do a very deliberate effort of hiring the right people, assessing their, their really skills, their competencies, and their experience, but also their character. And does that align? our values and what is needed for a business that's this this on right this challenging and so i think it's really about people it's also about technology deciding the right things to buy versus build that enable us and make us more competitive and then of course packaging and delivering that together but i think that i think that one thing that maybe i took from being an investor that i brought into this business that has been useful is that when i when you look at what the business lead needs, right, it's, it's you're going to build in two countries and you're going to deploy lots of capital and whatever. Because I came from that world of saying, okay, well, what resourcing would you need to be able to deliver that truth, right? That's something I think a lot of founders never had any training in, right? They sort of have to sort it out. And I, I actually, their boards and their investors should be helping them more. Uh, but it's something that I think I can skill to be able to do to say, all right, if you want to be a $100 million company, here is the resourcing. You got to build that from the bottom up, right? What is it going to take? What systems, what tools, processes, people, hours, and those man hours calculate to how many people, right? And then the salaries, and you've got to construct that organization and then raise the capital to resource and deliver that and think about all the lead times of all those activities. You want to hire 50 people? How long does that take, right? It takes some time, it takes some resourcing, et cetera. So it's a big answer to that question, but I want to say there's a lot that's gone into the thinking, but it, it's all about people. And, and a final thing, James, on that is, I believe companies are four things, right? They're people, strategies, execution, and cash to fund the first three. But it starts with people because they're the ones who define the strategies. They show up every day and execute or don't. And then of course they spend or waste or capitalize upon resource. And they're the people that the resources are backing, right? So it's, it, it's absolutely essential that you get the right people in any of these companies. The assets will do nothing without them. Yeah. So throughout this call and, and right before we, we jumped on this as well, we were talking about things like sustainability and how important that is to you. You, you mentioned about uh, expanding further internationally. Uh, we've spoken about partnerships um, with, with different organizations as well. So what are the big goals for the next sort of 12 months or so? Next 12 months is, uh, you, you laugh because I say this to my team, it's, it's not, to, not to mess it up, right? Not to drop the ball. We're sitting on the, on the cusp of greatness. We've raised the capital we need to build the immediate projects and opportunities in front of us. We're building in the UAE and Saudi and diversifying in crops, winning contracts with customers, hiring great people. And we have a really exciting new project in, which is in deep integration with a retailer who's given us a 10 year take or pay off take, 10 year commitment of buying everything we produce. And in this facility, we get to build a restaurant, a retail store, kind of a store within a farm, 
and an edutainment center to engage children, the Quady Foundation for the Advancements of Sciences. Really big, awesome idea of this thing is a manifestation of, of, of what we hope to ever achieve. So when you say, what do I hope to achieve? I hope not to screw it up, right? To drop the ball at the one yard line, uh, because I feel like if we just execute it against the plan and we can hold it together and deliver, we will be the company that we had hoped to be, right? We'll be of a significant scale. We're, we're breaking also the greatest form of profitability in a company is, is or, or sustainability in a company is also profitability. You can't do a lot of good for the world if you run out of money and go bankrupt. And so we actually are crossing into that critical next phase that will actually be a very profitable company pro forma for this year. So I think that, uh, James, if I were to say, what is my absolute goal? It's not to drop the ball, not to fumble, you know? Mm. And I, I think for a lot of founders, there's that fine line, isn't there, between, again, being conservative and worrying about messing it up, but also being aggressive enough to, to make their ambitions come true. So I think that's always a, a fine line. So j just to, to finish off then, where can people find out more about both yourself and, and Pure Harvest? Well, first of all, for those in the, in the GCC, the, please try us at the retail store. The product is exceptional. Um, it really, it says, tastes like it should is our slogan, but that was actually from our customers, not from ourselves. They thought it up. Um, it's, it's phenomenal. Uh, but for online, of course, we have a website, pureharvest.ae. We're all over social media and it's Pure Harvest Smart Farms uh, on most channels. Um, and then I think there's been a lot of media on us recently in CNN and CNBC that we did a great piece with uh, CNN with Julia Chatterley that talks about the company and also our growth aspirations, the capital we're raising to go forward and all. So please uh, have a look. And, and also our job board, for those of you who are looking for opportunities, we're hiring and we want more great people in our organization. I mean, I think that being part of uh, Pure Harvest is really being part of a change. We're driving how people, we're changing how people think about food in our regions and, and in these markets, the opportunity they have to localize production, the quality and sustainability available to them, right? And really it's changed everyone's thinking because like, you, like we said earlier, four years ago, people thought we were crazy. Now it seems to be a foregone conclusion and COVID only pushed everyone over the ledge, right? With seeing the fragility of supply chains, but that this controlled environment agriculture isn't going anywhere and Pure Harvest is pioneering that, that movement. So we hope that others will be part of the change with us.